All right, we're back. It's taken to everybody watching. I will apologize for two weeks of radio silence, but it was for good reason, I guess. It didn't feel good at the time. (laughs) Uh, But we are proud to be back doing the regular thing. There's something to be said. We don't come to church out of routine, but there's definitely something said to be for, for church routine. I, I, I enjoy being where I'm supposed to be on the days I'm supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> uh, so we are back again. I don't think, well, there are some very intelligent people in this room. So how many people remember what we studied three weeks ago? <laughs> Jarrett. We did talk a lot about atheism and and that. Any, uh, Brother Kenny, I think you had your hand. About the, uh, the Arminian foresight there that God looked, he did indeed look down the corridors of time, but he didn't foresee anybody believing in him. He saw that we had all gone aside, we had all together become filthy, and there's nothing that's good, no not one. That's what God really saw when he looked down the corridors. Yeah, we 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 talked we talked uh, extensively about the. Um, the verse that is mirrored in Romans um, and and all the implications therein. Anybody else? Sister Donna. Oh, okay. Sorry, you had your hand up, but you were correct. Uh, anybody else? Well, well, the two people that I expected <laughs> to, to to say something definitely did. So. Uh, And even if you look at the first verse, it, it, it's the it starts with a with an idea that the fool has said and said there is no God, and then it ends that said that that salvation comes out of Zion. Uh, it, it 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 takes the it takes the initial idea of what atheists and fools think about God, and it ends with there there is a God, and and, and more than there is a God, salvation descends from Him. That that the ability for our 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 uh, for our help comes from the Lord, and so you, you you can you can see that dichotomy there, which brings us to Psalm 15, which is actually shorter than 14. Uh, thank heavens, because I don't know how long my voice is going to hold out. Um, Psalm 15 um, is, I think, in my mind, a um, a, a a psalm that is a foretelling of Christ and who he is. The first verse of Psalm 15 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? It asks a question. This is actually a shift away from the actual meter that we have been seeing up to this point, which is, uh, as Brother Kenny said at the beginning of class, this sort of ramp up toward adulation to the Lord from a very, very low place, this opens with a question. It says that, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now, the rest of the psalm seeks to answer this question. It it, it seeks to outline who is worthy to stand in this place. Now, I'm going to go ahead and and, and, and tell you it it is not us. Um, that it is it is instantly and uh, 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 noticeable within the first couple of verses that our own ability, separate and apart of the covering blood of Christ, there is no way for uh, for us to stand there. So he says in verse two, "He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh truth in his heart." He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. Now, the first two verses, first of all, it says, He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. Now, there are a lot of people in the scriptures that I think we would say, well, they walked uprightly, or, or, they, or they, they were had a level of righteousness. Um, it is said of David that he was a man after God's own heart. Uh, Paul uh, he got to be an apostle 
when the time of apostles had, or the time for people to be qualified to be apostles had already ended based on God choosing to reveal himself bodily to him. There are people throughout Scripture who seem to be the paramount of what a Christian can be. But none of these people have the ability to fulfill even the beginning of the qualifications within themselves of um, of what verse 1 is asking for. It says, He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. We don't... The Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We don't, we the best the best thing that we can come up with are the things that are used and and, and I, I've heard I've heard it taught before that the, the rags are the same type of rags they use for lepers. Uh, you know even the even the even the best uh, even the um, even if we were to take away the leprosy aspect and just talk about what do we use rags for uh, you can use a, you can use a washcloth in, in in the bath to to cleanse your body what are you doing you're you're, you're literally rubbing dirt and dead skin cells off uh, uh, the the ladies they probably used a washcloth to help wash the dishes or a sponge of some type to what to scrape old old and dried food off of off of pans uh, you use you can use a washcloth to wipe down tables and but in all those cases what are you doing you're using the rag and you're dirtying it. It's getting worse. And, and our righteousness is the best that we can come up with. I'll even venture to say the best that, that Paul could come up with, that David could come up with, that any of these people are are black, are dirty. He says that he, he that walketh up rightly. Um, same thing. We're, 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 we're not... The, 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 the Bible, the, the, the people at Antioch were called Christians first there. To be Christian is to be Christ-like, which means that we are supposed to be trying to achieve things that are like Christ. We are supposed to be trying to live our life as he lived it. Knowing, of course, that every day will fail. The, the Christian walk is actually a walk of, of hopeful failure. Every day we awaken, hopefully with prayer and supplication, hoping to fulfill the will of our God. And every day we lay asleep and ask for forgiveness for the failure that we have. It's 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 it, it, it that sounds bleak, but there is there is newness in the forgiveness that we can receive at the end of the day. Where, hey, I didn't make it today. I'm my, I'm probably not going to make it tomorrow, but it is in that travail that God is glorified that you are seeking to do the things that he wants you to do. But Despite our best efforts, that does not answer the question of who can stand here. Of course, the answer is our Lord Jesus Christ. Who can who can stand in this place? Who can ascend completely justified in God's holy temple based on nothing more than their good works? There's only one man slash God that, that ever was able to do that. That ever and, and, and I think that's what the psalmist David is specifically talking about here. Uh, he goes further and it says, He backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil uh, to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Now, verse 3 starts talking, you know, uh, what did uh, Jesus say? That there, there are two commandments, love God and love man. And in both of those, you can sum up the entire law. This is an addressing, I think, of this very idea because it goes on. It, 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 verse 2 talks about our walk before God, and verse 3 starts, starts talking about our walk. Among, it says that he doesn't uh, bat bite with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. We're, we're, talking, we're talking about how that we can, that we're supposed to treat each other. Now, just because Jesus is the only one that can fulfill the question that's being asked by this psalm does not mean that this isn't a good roadmap for us. Our crimes as Christians, I think as Christian people, often do not... We, we, we talked in, in the interim between services briefly about uh, the, the, the use of alcohol and, 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 and people's villainization of objects because we're not willing to villainize ourselves. Um... But most often, Christians, we're able to, 
leave aside the things that are overtly negative. I would say everybody in here is probably abstinent from drink. Everybody in here is probably has probably never run around on their on their wife or or or, or their husband. Everybody in here has you know, we we've all we we can we can list the things that we're good at, but I think a a earmark of the pro, of a problem with Baptist people specifically is our inability not to cannibalize each other. We we're like sharks. We're the apex predator in the in the seas. But sh- and sharks are deceptively intelligent. They are they are not mindless eating machines. They God designed them for a very specific purpose, and they carry out that purpose with deadly precision. But do you want to ever see a shark act stupid? Dump some chum in the water, and they go nuts. They smell blood, their eyes roll up, they have, they have protective coverings that cover their eyes, and they just start biting. And a lot of time, they'll end up biting each other. If it's a school of sharks, they'll kill each other for, 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 for chum, for, for trash fish. And I think Christians are the same way. We see a wounded church member, and our first reaction is never to go to that person and offer assistance. Our, our, our first reaction is not what Christ basically did in his par- told them in his parable when, he, when the man was, uh, was, was down on the side of the road and, and the Samaritan went to him and he poured oil and wine in his wounds and carried him and bound him up and carried him and put him in the hotel. That's not our first reaction. Our first reaction most of the time for most Christians is to kick them while they're down. They're weak. So let's just do the piranha thing. Let's just all school around them and bite them and, until there's nothing left of them. And we do it under the guise of, well, if they were doing that, well, they must not have been a real Christian anyway. We, 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 we do it under the guise of, well, the, if, if, there, if, if X, Y, and Z have happened, were they even actually saved? Uh, an ability that, mind you, is not given to us. We're not to judge our fellow man. Because I would venture to say, and this is, and this is probably part of it, and, and this is why I like to liken it to sharks, because we all have the same nature. We all have that desire that probably the reason that we're so ready to kick other people while we're down is because in our hearts, we've committed that sin. Or maybe we're committing it and nobody knows about it. And so it's so much easier. It's like, oh, well, the, the spotlight's on someone else. Let's just go ahead and kick them in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the ribs while they're on the floor. Brother Larry, why don't you take a shot at them for, uh, from the head? Brother Junior, why don't you, why, why, why don't you, why don't you stomp them while, we're, while they're down? And I'm not, I'm, uh, as I call them out, I'm not saying that they've ever done this. But my, my, my point being is we like to gang up. And, and the, the, the psalm here says that, that we're, we're he that bat biteth not with his tongue. You know, I actually read, um, I think it was Spurgeon, on this very psalm, and he and he pointed out, and it, it's very true, I don't think it's a revelation, but I, I liked his, he talked about the tongue specifically, that it is a more biting sword than a man can hold in his hand, ever. Well, why don't we fight big global wars anymore? Well, because politicians, they deal, they deal blows daily with their tongues. We don't fight these global conflicts anymore because you have two men that sit there and they yell at each other for hours on end. And we're just the same way. A lot of times, those, those blows are not physical. Those kicks that I was talking about are not physical. What it will be is, Brother Kenny, and then this is not, this is not an actual uh, situation, but just for sake of sake of uh, thing, Brother Ken sees um, uh, Sister Heather out somewhere. And, and, and he's, oh, well, what's she doing over there? Brother Ken, he calls up Brother Larry, and they're talking about regular conversation. And Brother Ken says, hey, did you hear about what I saw? Brother Larry says, well, that is the hope, but that is not where this usually goes. Exactly. Where it usually goes is, well, we're, we're, somebody's got to do something about this. And after they get done with their phone conversation, Brother Larry picks up the phone. Brother June, did you hear about that? The, 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 the pretense of godly conversation is completely lost, and we go straight to the bat biting. Brother Junior, did you hear about that? Well, you, you, did you hear what Brother Adam told me? 
And little did Ken know, I was in the area too, and I saw it from a different perspective. And before long, what should have been probably Brother Ken going to them and saying, hey, I, I see you're in this situation. Is there anything I can do to help? Right. Leaving the 90 and 9 and going and seeking one. Instead, this has become, the next Sunday when Sister Heather shows up, this turns into the Salem witch trials. And all the false accusers are assembled, whether they're false or not, and we're burning down one member. And, and then we wonder, then we sit back, why isn't our church is growing? Where's the love? Where's where 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 is the where is the bro and brothers and sisters fight? Believe me, I grew up with my fair share of them. Brothers and sisters fight. It's in your it's in human nature. But I, I'll always say that when when somebody was on Matthew, you ain't you're not gonna you're not gonna hurt Matthew because I'm standing here and and if if I if somebody's gonna hurt him, it's gonna be me. <laughs> Nobody's gonna mess with my sister. Because I'm standing here. Why? Because there's a, a brotherly and sisterly bond there. But us as Christians, we just completely leave that aside, and we're just we're so ready to burn somebody. Why? Because it, it elevates our self righteousness. It is literally the Baptist version of, "Dear Lord, I'm glad that I am not like this Pharisee. I fast three times a week, and I and and, and on and on we go about how great we are and how awful they are." And then we, 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 we're concerned about church growth. We're concerned about missionizing. And in all the meantime, even, sometimes even in jest, now I will, I will even say that the, the jesting aspect, I'm probably more guilty than anybody. We jest about our piety over other people. And even that does not present a spirit of love. Like it or not, Jesus didn't hang out with the elite of society. He had the opportunity to it, and he did it one time. And it was when he was 12 years old, and he was in the temple, and he was showing them how much more he knew about the scriptures than they did. And then the next time he shows up on the scene, he's hanging out with fishermen. He's hanging out with, with prostitutes. All of them saved, mind you, but still, he was hanging out with the low, lowest of the low. Jesus didn't, didn't associate himself with the religious pious. Why? Well, I think if he was to come to earth right now, he wouldn't associate himself with us because we're, we're open sepulchers. We're pious on the outside. We're white on the outside, but inside we're full of dead men's bones. In whose eye, in verse 4, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. Now, this is among the verses in this chapter, the one that really led me to believe that this is actually a prophecy of Jesus because we don't have the ability to condemn even the vilest of sinner. So who is the one person in whose eyes judgment, condemnation can actually be made? Well, according to the scriptures, there's one person in the Bible that says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. There's only one person able to make that judgment, and said, well, "Brother Adam, aren't we supposed to aren't we supposed to keep watch? You've you've talked about watching from your yeah. Well, judging and watching is two different things. I'll I'll make this analogy again. I can look across a room and tell an orange from an apple. I can't if I do this, but if I have my glasses, I can tell across a room what an orange and an apple is. But only." Only a someone who is trained in examining fruit can tell me if that's a grade A apple or a grade A orange. I don't know the difference. I know if they're rotten or not, and usually I have to take a bite to find that out. Only God can examine two apples, me and Brother Ken. He can only take two apples and say, this one's a superior apple to this one, or anything else. I can see a lost person coming from a while away. Usually it's because my spirit doesn't commune with them. I reach out, I try, and, and I'm rejected. Why? Because they're dead inside and I'm alive inside. But just like I can in, identify an orange and an apple doesn't mean I can go to Brother Junior and say, well, his walk is just a little bit behind Brother Jared's walk. In the grand scheme of things, if I was to weigh this out, and we try to get all, we're, we're, like, the, we're like those people on TV that, that do the food tasting on those food competitions, and they eat a little bite of food, and they're like... 
Well, this has got more. I, I can tell you used a little extra vanilla. Are you serious? You can't tell me they used a, a little extra vanilla extract. There's no way. Unless, unless that, ju- and a lot of times they'll have a celebrity judge that'll try to make those, and I think there's no way that they know. But a lot of times there'll be a trained chef on that panel. And I can believe that person. Why? Because food is their business. They probably can tell whether you used a, a certain type of sugar or not because they know. They've been trained. And you know what? God can tell if there's a little bit more sugar in Brother Kenny than it is me, but I'm not going to walk over here and tell, say, hey, Kenny, you're not very sweet today. Why? Because I don't know. And it's not for me to judge him. If I spot obvious error, I'm going to go to him and say, hey, brother, I've messed up on this kind of stuff before. Let me show you where I think that you're wrong, and let's have a discussion. Let's talk about it. Communication, I think, is something that, I, this is not just in churches, but in American society, we've just fell apart on. We're, we're, the, we're the most connected we've ever been in the, in the history of mankind, other than, I would say, probably Babel, when we were all just kind of living together. And yet, we're the m- most disconnected that we've ever been. I, I made a mistake during, during the business meeting. I read a text from Jarrett, and to be fair, I was in, in a fever. But I read a text from Jarrett, and I thought that Dad was going to expand his financial class to 20 lessons. And that was not even remotely true. But when you play a game of telephone like that, stuff is lost. And, you know, that should be an easy communication. But even then, we lose something there. But we, we, don't, we just don't communicate with our brothers and sisters more. I don't, I, I, we, don't, we don't walk up to, 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 to Sister Sarah and say, uh, how, are you, how are you doing? Uh, are, 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 how's, your, how's, your, how's your spirit life? We, we, we don't get that deep with people. We want to stay on the superficial level and just send a text message and say, I hope you're doing great. And move on with our life. Because why? Because we're, most of the time, because we're selfish. We think more about our, whatever our problems are, they've got to be more, more uh, dire than anybody else's problems. And this is how we live our days. Um, um, my glasses are falling off in my head because of this silly headset. Um, but, he that honoreth, uh, but, he, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He, uh, he that uh, he that sweareth uh, uh, to his uh, to his own hurt and changeth not. He putteth not out his money his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Now, brother Larry's probably going to be teaching something uh, to this uh, to this nature whenever he does his financial class. But uh, he, what he's talking about, and I don't I, I don't really ever recall Jesus having a lot of money. It seemed it seemed like. Uh, uh, he was fairly destitute in his days. The, 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 the foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. So I feel like Jesus was, was what, 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 but it says here that, that this person, that this person that is a, a, able to take up residency on the holy hill doesn't lend that, go out to lenders. Now, I'll, there's probably everybody in this room, I would be venture to say, has at one point or not had some type of debt. We, I know my house is on a payment. I, I, there's no way I'm coming up with tens of thousands of dollars right now to pay off to the bank. We're the reason I think that it is important, especially for a Christian, but I think also probably the reason that Jesus didn't have a lot of possessions in his lifetime is because when you start having things here, you're connected here. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that the the that the, the debtor is servant to the lender. Well, the Bible also says you cannot serve two masters. So, how does that work? We're we're gonna have to serve one another, and you know what? That's what. And and I'm not saying for for all of us to start live you know uh, living out on the street just so we don't have any possessions. But what I what I am saying is, you know why I have to work? Why I have to dedicate eight to ten hours a day to something that has nothing to do with the Lord? Because I have a people to feed. A house to pay for, vehicles to pay for, cards to pay off. I have, I have. Uh, Brother Kenny was talking about water bills and power bills. You, you got to pay for those utilities because boy knows whenever it was uh, ten degrees on in, on in, on Christmas Day, I had that heat cranked up. We have to pay for those things. But in so doing, we disconnect ourselves from the Lord. We have to. 
you 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 literally cannot serve two masters. Now, can I from the barber shop witness to somebody in the chair? Sure, done it. I've I've talked to I've had some better conversations with people about the Lord from the barber shop than I've ever had in a church building. So that that is possible, but that's not an everyday occurrence. By any, but some people don't even want to talk. Brother Larry, I bet every every day over at the nursing home, it ain't just a skip down down through. You know, you're not just hopping and skipping and praising the Lord every time that you're passing pills. There's no way. Every everything that we do outside of the Lord, specifically for this world, we're not doing something for Him. Which is why we we need to seek to free ourselves. From this world, why is it good to have bills paid off? What if I need to up and move for the work of the Lord? I'm gone. Now, if I was, if the Lord said, Adam, I need you to move to another part of the world right now, I'd be like, Well, Lord, at minimum, we're looking at a month. <laughs> at minimum, because now I've got to sell a house. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to prep somebody to run all this this equipment here at the church. I've got, I've got. I've got a month of work to do at least before I can do that. And why is that? Because I'm so connected to this world. I'm so locked in to what, and, and we're not supposed to be that way. Pilgrims and strangers. Brother Larry preached this morning about Abraham. And when, he didn't even mention this, but I, whenever I was reading back the verses, uh, it said, uh, it's, he said, where is Sarah? And she said, he's in, she's in the tent. And it just made me think, because uh, my mind likes to chase rabbits, um, Abraham dwelt for decades in a tent. He never had a home. He never had a place to call his own. In fact, whenever people tried to get him to integrate, he said, I can't do it. I've got to go. In, in, in fact, when he looked for a place to bury Sarah, he wanted to buy it of his own. He he, he didn't want to be lent. He didn't he want to be beholden to nobody. Why? Because a, that was not a, Abraham was a pilgrim. Abraham was a stranger in a land that wasn't his. He was he was there doing the work that God told him to do, and, and in the places that he was, and and he messed up. Abraham messed up just like we mess up. But he was out there he was out there doing the thing he was he was and we're supposed to be the same way we're supposed to be sojourners we're so, we're so, we're not supposed to be locked into this place we're supposed to be able to 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 go when when god says go we're supposed to be available to him why why does the bible say that it's better better if if, if a man doesn't marry and ladies i know i was making jokes about women at the first of the class but it's better for all people to be single why because we can do the work of the lord anytime we want when you have a spouse and when that marriage ultimately yields children, like it or not, you've got responsibilities that you cannot escape. Brother Kenny, because you have a spouse, there are certain things as a, as a ministry man you'll never be able to do. You'll never be like Paul. Why? Because Paul was never attached to nobody. And that doesn't, that doesn't make a marriage wrong because God created marriage. But every tie that we make is one that we're not making for him. We've, we've, if we're going to seek to be Christ-like, if we're going to seek to be the type of people that are at least daily striving to be worthy of the holy tabernacle, of worthy to dwell on that holy hill, we're going to have to make steps every day away from this life, away from this world, and it's going to be brutal. Brother Larry said in his message about that everything that you do, nothing that you do for the Lord is probably going to be pleasant to your flesh, and it's not going to be. I've read through Paul's ministry several times, and there's nothing pleasant about his ministry that I can, that I can recall. Not a single thing. He was shipwrecked. He was he was he was beaten mercilessly. He had he 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 and ultimately he lost his head. And yet it is that type of life that we seek to model ourselves after. But we seek to model ourselves after from a Pharisaical standpoint. We 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 want to be Paul but be comfortable as well. And those two things are never going to intersect to each other because physical comfort has nothing to do with spiritual growth. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. 
No, I, I still think that the answer to this question of who can dwell in the tabernacle and who's on the holy hill, I still think that is Christ. But good news, lost person. Greater news, saved person. You've got a covering. That despite your worst day, you're worthy of all that. You've got it. You've got when when the Lord God looks down with His vile person condemning eyes, He's going to look at Sister Diane and say, "She lived a perfect life. How, how is this possible?" And, and He's going to look to Jesus. And Jesus said, "Lamb's Book of Life, right here. I covered that. That's why she looks perfect in your eyes." And He's going to say, "Enter in into the joys of the Lord." Every, it, it, all the rewards that my son earned, they're all yours because you somehow you lived a perfect life and, and, and you're going to fall down. And you're going to say, Jesus, he did everything. He's, 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 he's worthy of it all. And then the next person in line is going to go, and Brother Ken, he's going to look down, he's going to, another one. Another one lived a perfect life. How is this possible? And, and Jesus is going to say, he's in the Lamb Book of Life. And he's like, again, enter in. And Brother Ken's going to fall down on his knees. And over and over. And you know what? I think we're going to be surprised. I think there's going to be millions of people there just like that. And the chorus, I love listening, even though it's Catholic or, or, or even, even Amish music, but I love listening to chorus music because I think it's a very similar to what we're going to hear in heaven. The, the, the high tenors, the low basses, and the, and, and, and the lead in the middle, all hallelujah, Amen. hallelujah, all together. Why? Because everything that's listed in this chapter that we're incapable of doing on our own, he did it all. The, the words of the hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Has there ever, ever been a better time to be alive? Thousands, millions of people look forward to it. Hundreds of thousands live through it, and yet we're the benefactors of a, of a life lived perfectly. Any questions or comments about today's lesson? It was probably a little bit of a ramble, but uh, my thoughts were going a hundred different different directions. Uh, Sister Donna? Self-justification is the beginning of a pharisaical attitude, and it, we talked about it in between the services. We have we have the reason we villainize so many things is because we have to justify our own sin. My sin's not as bad as his sin, but the Bible says if you've broken one part, you've broken it all. You're literally born to it. We take the sin like a duck takes the water. Well, it it is a I would say for preachers and for teachers it's a higher contrast.
here I was on the receiving end, but I realized that there were there were times when I spoke way too quickly about someone else, and it's just so easy to say, "Oh yeah, brother so and so, he's falling into that trap now," or "Brother so and so believes this, or he's abandoned this doctrine," or you know, and we don't even we don't even thoroughly investigate. We don't mm-hmm. even thoroughly see is this accusation true, or are we going off of like something we've heard about him from third hand basis, and now we're spreading a false lie about. Ruining somebody's ministry. Yeah, you, you Well, you, you can, you can ruin a lie in a moment with, 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 with a word, and, and that, that's another thing too. What, whatever you're doing, there is someone watching. It may be, it, it, it could even be a child, but they know. But it makes us feel so, so pious, you know, when we say, well, so and so is believing this doctrine, but I still believe. It. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how they could do. I don't know. Well, and, and the thing, is, I don't know how they could do that. How, how how is this possible? You know, every, every every but 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 how how do I get up every morning and and do the, some of the things that I do? How? Yeah. I'm sure there. I'm sure there. Uh, and but we have we have to remember the example of our Lord because especially when things are done unto us, we're it's bad enough when we see somebody else doing something, but when things people do something to us, we're so quick to be. But. Think about the one person in human history that had the ability to cast stones, and what did he do? He went and he bent down and he wrote in the sand, and and he said, "Where where's your where are your accusers? I'm not going to accuse you either. Go and sin no more." The for the 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 bandwidth, if you will, of Christ's forgiveness is unfathomable, and if we could mirror a tenth of that, I bet a hundred percent of our problems would fade. Because our ability to hold, uh, just as Christ's bandwidth for forgiveness is wide and infinite, our bandwidth to hold grudges is nearly as vast. Because it's just like Brother Kenny said, somebody can say something, you're like, how could they say that about me? I thought they were my friend. And sometimes that thought will carry to the grave with people. You know, there were a lot of when this church split off from Bumpus, Bumpus Mills. There's probably been, there's probably a lot of hurt feelings. There's probably still a lot of hurt feelings about that, about everything that was said. And it was I, I was just a child at the time, and I remember it just being chaos, actual just disorder. But I bet if one person had sought to forgive, there were fences that could have been mended there. Idle words tossed aside in, in, in place of, I know, I hear what you're saying. We're going to work this out. But in the meantime, we're still brothers and sisters. And we're supposed to work. We can, we can work through this together. We can, we can do this. But we're, we're just, and it's me too, we're, we're, just, we're just too quick to, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're blessed with so with so much truth and doctrine. We've got to remember that's not something we hold over people. That's something we spread out to people. Amen. And, yes, Sister John.
it is our lack of compassion that I think the reason that there's not as many people being saved. I will I will profess this that it was it was the compassion and concern of my parents that began my thoughts on my lost soul. Now they didn't save me. I ain't saying that, but it is it was their desire and concern about that made me realize that there might be an issue with myself. And we don't show enough compassion to people. We're 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 we're, we're so dis disinterested because we're so pious. We're we're, we're Baptists with a capital B. That's still extremely high. Yeah. Definitely pray for this one. That's. All right. Any other comments, questions, concerns? All right. Well, next week we journey into chapter 16, which as long as I was able to stretch five verses, just think of what I could do with 11. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will see you all next week. Y'all have a good one.